Genau, also herzlich willkommen zu unserem nächsten Slot. Wir haben ja im Zuge der Konferenz schon über ziemlich viele verschiedene Themen diskutiert und das Thema Daten ist natürlich auch immer ein sehr wichtiges Thema. Und jetzt in diesem äh, Slot werden wir uns sozusagen auf der einen Seite so ein bisschen mit dem Thema raumbezogene Daten und Geodaten beschäftigen und wie man die sozusagen auch für ökologische Zwecke nutzen kann und auch für andere Zwecke. Und wir werden uns sozusagen auch nochmal mit der materiellen Basis befassen sozusagen. Also was steckt sozusagen eigentlich in unseren Handys drin für Rohstoffe und welche Implikationen sind sozusagen damit verbunden mit dem Abbau dieser Rohstoffe und so weiter und so fort. Ja, und ich freue mich sehr, Aurelie Shapiro begrüßen zu dürfen. Sie ist Satellitenfernerkundungsspezialistin vom WWF und wird uns jetzt ein bisschen was über die Mangrovenwälder erzählen. Und ich freue mich sehr. Einen kleinen Applaus bitte. <lacht> Super. Danke, Frederike. Ähm, ja, also ich bin Aurelie, ich arbeite bei der WWF seit acht Jahren und ich glaube, Sie würden mich bedanken, wenn ich meine Vorträge auf Englisch mache, ähm, weil ich bin ein bisschen müde am Sonntag. So, lieber auf Englisch. Ja, um, yeah, so I'm going to tell you today about mangroves. Um, This is a little drone image in the background uh, that I took just a couple weeks ago in Tanzania in the Rufiji Delta. Um, those are some fishing eagles cruising around and some guys pirogue um, in uh, the largest mangrove um, area in Tanzania. So I'm going to take you on a little tour now about um, who I am and what we're doing here. So um, yeah, my name is Orly and I'm a remote sensing specialist. I was three years in, at WF US, and now I've been in uh, Berlin at WF Germany since 2010. Um, well, just some more information about myself, but this is uh, the areas on this map. Uh, every square represents a national office, and every green area represents a priority ecoregion, which is where WF focuses their work. We have green ecoregions and blue ecoregions, uh, showing you basically what is a terrestrial area of interest and what is a uh, marine area of interest in each of these has um, a bunch of programs around it, major threats, uh, you know, major species. Um, Coast East Africa is the one where um, the Rafiji Delta is. Um, and yeah, it's known for its mangroves, manatees, elephants, um, and so on, a very large area. And I'm going to take you on a tour through there um, and show you what we're doing to conserve the, uh, the ecosystems there. So I'm going to keep on going here on my cool little map. So yeah, as you all know, WBF is one of the largest, if not the largest, conservation organization in the world. We have over 6,000 staff worldwide, and we're present in over 100 countries. And our main goal is to create a world where humans and nature can live together. And part of my role then is to support a lot of these offices with what they need in terms of satellite imagery, drone images, analysis, and so on. And since this is a digital conference, I'm going to take you through one of our projects that we've recently digitalized, in fact. So what are mangroves? If you've never heard of them, they're salt-tolerant trees. They're usually found in the coastal zones, in the tropical areas, um, you know, in Asia, um, Africa, South America. I'll show you an example. Um, and what's important about mangroves is that they're really important for climate, most of all. They have a lot of uh, carbon stored in them, and they sequester carbon, which is good for climate mitigation. Uh, they're also very important for stabilizing coastlines and um, providing fish habitat. So all the people that live around the mangroves really depend um, you know, on these ecosystems for, for their habitats, right? A fish and shrimp tend to uh, use the mangroves as nurseries, and this is really important for all the people that depend on fish. Um, to survive. And this is a satellite image from the uh, Sundarbans. Um, this is in, on, the co on the border of Bangladesh and India. And it's also an interesting habitat here because uh, it's actually home to tigers. Um, it has a really unique uh, population of tigers that actually live in these mangroves and I don't even know how they do it, but yeah, they t manage to crawl around the mangroves and uh, yeah, that's where they live. So just another, just an interesting um, aspect of mangroves here and those mangroves are protected. So. Um, actually, the mangroves in Bangladesh, you can look at it on a Google Earth image, but you can see the mangroves there, and basically everything around it is completely developed, completely deforested, huge cities and so on, and these tigers are kind of stuck in that mangrove. And where are mangroves found around the world? Here is a map of their um, distribution, so you can see the mangroves in green, and the darker purple represents the countries with the most mangroves, so Indonesia, I think, is up here um, with the most. Um, and um, yeah, so we have a lot in, 
in Eastern Africa, coastal East Africa as we call it, and Madagascar, and of course Central America. Right, and so, so what are the major threats to mangroves? Um, deforestation is a big one. Uh, this is actually a picture from my last trip to Tanzania. People have chainsaws now, so they can cut down almost everything, and they cut down the wood for building, um, for to burn it, or just mostly, well, to sell the logs and so on, uh, even though it's illegal. In a lot of other places, uh, mangroves are getting converted to shrimp farms. This is happening a lot in Asia, and that's what that looks like in the middle there. Make sure you can see that. Oops. Uh, and uh, then, of course, coastal development. So uh, an example from Karachi here is uh, people clear the mangroves and use the nice waterfront for hotels or homes. Um, and this is, uh, this is what's making uh, mangroves one of the most threatened uh, ecosystems worldwide. So what can we do about it? Basically, we can, ex we can assess them, we can protect them, and we can restore them. And that's what WWF is working, with, working on. Now, to know where something is, to, be, to assess it, to protect and restore it, you have to actually know where it is. So I use Google Earth Engine. It's, a, um, it's actually a free platform from Google that has petabytes and petabytes of satellite data. Almost every satellite image that is freely available in the world is in their system. And you can get an account for free and just go in. And if you know Java code, which I don't, but I do the best I can, uh, you can process and go through um, more than 30 years of satellite imagery. And it has lots of and it's new data all the time. And the best thing about it is that it runs on the Google servers. So something that would take maybe a month or two months to process on my computer, I can do within a matter of seconds on the Google Cloud. And it's free. So here's just an example of um, some of the mapping I've been doing. This is in, um, in Madagascar. And let's see here. Um, you can actually, and um, I have a link to this presentation at the end, so you can go look. But you can see a lot of these changes in mangroves uh, over time, and then I've actually mapped then the mangroves um, in 1995, 2000, 2015, 2010, 15, and 18, and you can see the mangrove changes over time, so the red signifies the loss and so on. Um, yeah, and then and you also do see some gain. There's, the mangroves do grow uh, wherever there's kind of sediment being captured or new islands form in the rivers. You do find uh, mangroves do grow back, and they're actually pretty resilient. So actually, in a lot of places, if you just leave them alone, they actually grow back rather quickly. So there, so it's not you know we can't lose all hope, I guess, for the um, you know for the for the mangroves. But that's just an example of what some of the outputs that um, I create look like, all in the cloud. So I'm going to show you then now a case study uh, in, in the Rafiji Delta. So this is this place in Tanzania and how we get from these satellite images and, and how do we basically make this data so we can uh, support conservation. So here we are in um, Tanzania. I'm going to zoom out a little bit. Um, but it's, this is Africa. We have Mozambique and Tanzania. And that yellow dot is the Rafiji Delta. And it's a delta ecosystem. And I'll show you. I'll zoom it in. Um, and it's very interesting. It's the largest um, mangrove ecosystem in, in, in Tanzania. There's bigger ones in Mozambique, but this is a big one. So right here we have the Fiji Delta, uh, sorry, the Fiji River. It comes up, and it goes up to the delta here, and you know spreads out. And all that dark green stuff is mangrove. And um, if you look in a bit, there's you know you'll see actually some more resolution here. Um, you'll see that now. There's kind of encroachment down there. There's lots of um, rice plantations and pastures and things like that. You can see now people are kind of encroaching on the mangroves uh, and reducing, uh, reducing the area. So um, what we were charged with, so we have a project with the US Forest Service and USAID. Uh, we want to first know where all the mangroves are in the Rafiji Delta and what's going on. Why? There's a couple important things to think about. One is that the river actually re reversed course something like 30 years ago. It was actually flying south, and now it's flowing north. Um, anyway, so, so there's lots of, it's a dynamic ecosystem, right? And these, um, we want these mangroves to stay there in the long term, and, and we need to really conserve them and, and know what's happening in the environment. So 30 years ago, we had this uh, change in the mangroves, and the, and the mangroves are there, and there was an uh, inventory done by the Norwegians, and they flew over with an airplane. Back in the day, they would do stereo images with, with an airplane, and they 
mapped, basically they identified every single stand of mangrove that was there in 1989. Every species, um, stock, height, all that stuff. And then we went back, people have gone back, it's a, it's a very studied ecosystem, people are going back and they were putting their inventory plots there and they were looking at the species and the species that we see there now are completely different than the species that were there in 1989. So it's, first thing, it's kind of weird. So we still have mangrove, but wait, how are the species totally different? Well, simple, it's that there's a couple species that are really straight, uh, straight poles, hardwood, those are the best uh, wood for building houses and for construction materials. So people have been basically pulling out certain species out of the, out of the mangroves and changing the, the ecosystem completely. So that was one of our, one of our uh, goals, was to then look at these species and see what's happening, see if we can map the species and see where there's still original species where we might need to protect some of these. Um, and where the species have maybe completely changed. And also to see where the mangroves have been lost, where we could uh, restore them, and so on. And there was also, uh, I'll show you a picture later, uh, there was also these uh, weird invasive lianas. There's, there are reports that there are areas where there's a couple mangrove trees left, and then they get just covered by these vines, just completely covered, and you can't even see the tree that's underneath it. And so we want to see if we can also see where those lianas are, and if we can map them, and you know, send people in to to you know, do something about them because to restore the mangrove you have to deal with these lianas and it's the worst thing ever. I've tried to walk through them and it's, it's just very unpleasant. So we're really interested in the degradation of the system over time and the changes and so on uh, in species. Um, so yeah, so here we are in a, oops, this one's not working. So here we are in uh, the, I have a little mangrove uh, data portal. So all the data that we, um, that we work with um, gets put in the system, this ArcGIS online system. And just to tell you, you know, some of the th data we have. So for example, here's a field observation from, um, this is actually from 2015. One of our partners went and they say that, okay, this is a certain species and so on. Um, Aficenia, which we saw a lot of, and we have photos and so on. And so all of our field data is collected in this, um, in this nice little system here. You can see here is a rice field. Um, so there's a little bit of reconnaissance. And then what we did, all these green and other points, these are um, data we collected uh, October 5th to October 12th, um, and all go into the system, and I'll show you how that works. And we, um, what we did is we go into the field and we look at what kind of condition we have, it's degraded, uh, what kind of uh, species we have, and the human impacts, and so on. Now, let's see, um, there's a little button here, let me just look up here, here we go. Oops, sorry. Just wanted to show you um, some of the cool stuff about this data. So it all goes in. Um, it all goes into the system. It's just all online and in the cloud, right? We don't have any. Um, I'm going to show you like what we can do. How we can. Um, but I've I've actually all of the data collected that we collected in the in October in our field mission go into this cloud system, and you can see already. You know our donors and everybody can already see um, what the situation looks like. And so for all of the points we visited, they're mostly degraded, 55%. Only very few were intact. There was a lot of young stuff, other, and then some dead or deforested. And so our whole system is completely digital. Um, we don't have data sheets anymore. Back in the day, we would go into the mangroves and you'd have a waterproof paper and you'd write down coordinates from a GPS and then you could never read that person's handwriting or you'd spill your drink on the, wa on the sheet or you'd lose it or they'd get out of order or all this stuff would happen, and um, data collection was just very tedious and error prone. Um, the biggest problem, people flipping around the latitude and longitude, you know, it sounds really simple, but when you're in an area like this close to the equator, it's actually a huge problem and you don't know, um, you know, where the point is, and so the point is, is useless. Or um, people might, you know, misspell something and then you gotta fix it and everything, and then there was always this um, data transfer at the end of every, field day and it was the worst. You've, you've been walking around the mud forever and you come back and then you have three hours of work where you have to transcribe all of that data into the computer. Um, we actually invented a drink called the data sheet because we would just drink these drinks while we had to put the data sheets in and um, it was, yeah, it's, it was not good. And so now we do everything all digital and I'll show you how it works in an app. Um, and then this, uh, yeah, and, and this um, uh, map is, is open and available. I can show it to you. I did want to show you, um, oh, it's not working. So we did have uh, this, so we, yeah, here's some, some data we've collected. And we did have, um, yeah, these old maps that, that we were able to compare and use in the field. So I'm just gonna show you down. Let's keep going. Yeah, so what we did in the field. Um, so no more data sheets. 
um, we just had an app. And this is our field team here. Um, there's me and Helga, my consultant, and our, our local teams um, from WWF and partners. Um, one guy, we called him Ronaldo, he's wearing soccer shoes. Uh, you have to walk through the mud and it's absolutely atrocious. And I have some videos here, I can show you what it looks like. I can see the button. Sorry, hold on a second, Ooh, yeah. It's um, painfully slow. This is actually not even the deepest mud. Um, we have photos where we're up to our chest in mud. It's like super terrifying. Um, and it's just so, so tiring. And you have to go through all of these, um, you have to go through these dense stands and there's bees and there's mosquitoes and it's the worst. So um, yeah, and at the same time you'd have to have your GPS and your data sheet and all that. So we've done everything now with an app um, that's the QR code. So it's an East Africa mangrove app um, that's in English and Swahili. And um, it basically lets everybody collect the same data, whether you're a Swahili speaker or an English speaker, it has pictures of the species, it has the local names in Swahili, um, it has all this stuff, and so we could split up, everybody has a phone or a tablet, and we could just all collect data. And uh, we trained our guys um, how to use the tablets, it's super easy, very intuitive. Um, yeah, and we were able to multiply our data collection. I think the app should be here. Is it here? Uh, I guess you can't see it, okay. So um, anyway, the app is just a form, it's a, it's a form on the Android and uh, yeah, and then you can see where you are on a map, you can see the old map from 1989, you can see satellite imagery from today, you can see where you are and then you can get, so, sort of go and, and you know, find data or find the place you wanna go. Um, yeah, we also had to, you know, go through some of these, deep into these mangroves with a boat. Um, there's crocodiles, there's, um, yeah, tons of little, roots, um, you know, that hit your boat and, uh, and, you know, damage the engine and so on. You get stuck in here all the time. Um, you really have to be careful with the tides. You know, high tide means you can go in here, but you only have about 20 to 30 minutes whoop, to, uh, you know, collect your data and come out and so on. And then as you see on the side, you know, you see lots of, still lots of clearing and, and deforestation and so on. And so what we would do is we'd take the boat in, we'd split up our teams, we'd go really, really fast and try to collect a lot of data and get back in the boat before the tide went out. Um, and you didn't believe me at how deep the mud was. This guy, uh, this is Carl. He's actually like two meters tall and he's up to his waist in mud. And um, yeah, it's when uh, you sometimes have to meet the boat at low tide, you'd have to go through this mud and um, yeah, and try to get there. I have an idea. I want to make some sort of bamboo mat where you can walk on the mud and stuff. But um, yeah, people are getting stuck in there all the time. There comes the boat. Um, yeah, so that's uh, fun field work. Um, fun field work in the mangroves. Now the thing is, okay, so it's all nice and good to walk around the mud and get really messy and get stung by mosquitoes, but now we have drones. So with the drone, you can actually, um, you know, fly a little bit above where you are and then um, explore areas actually more than you could uh, do on foot. So I have two multi-copter drones. Here's our team again, and this is what we, at, at low tide, we could stop on a sandbank in the middle of the river, and we could fly the drone and actually collect information, almost like a satellite, from the drone. Now, my drone, um, I've kind of hacked it. It has two cameras on it. It has a, a, a normal camera and then a near-infrared camera, which is on the right, which is a great way to explore uh, vegetation health or, or vigor or, um, yeah, the kind of the cool, uh, what is it, chlorophyll, um, reflects a lot of near IR, and so that's how you can um, use these images to combine them and then come up with a vegetation index, and then we can start looking at degradation and things like that. Um, one thing that people do now with these drones is um, it's called structure from motion. You can actually take all these overlapping images, so I fly it just like a satellite, lots of overlapping images, it goes back and forth, I program it, drone goes, comes back, and it collects all the data and it mosaic it together, and you actually make a really cool 3D surface. And you can see the little holes in here, and you can actually infer height. Um, all with just a $300 camera stuck on my $200 drone. Um, so, um, you know, this is the kind of data you can get now from these kind of commercial systems, and they're really easy to deploy, works on my tablet, and so on. So the drones are really helping us um, you know, collect a lot more data, which we can then put back into the satellite imagery and actually see what's there. Because the whole point of a satellite image analysis is that you can't do it with the satellite image alone. You really need to collect you know, data from the ground. 
Um, however, the drone is not the perfect solution. Um, it still is really tough. You have to find a spot to take off and a spot to land and hope that the battery doesn't die on the way back. Um, you'll notice my mud is up to my waist. Um, we had to carry this box there and one of the guys was like, he was up to his neck in the mud. And um, I, already, I tried to launch it from a boat and I actually lost one of the drones. It's, so it's like launching from a boat's really difficult. So I really wanted to go on land. And then, um, believe it or not, we were in the middle of nowhere and someone managed to call like the Tanzanian, Tanzanian FBI or something who came in and um, put us all on lockdown for a day, even though we had a permit. Um, so, you know, a drone is not the perfect solution, but it, was, um, it is really helpful when we can. Unfortunately, we could only fly a couple days because of all these permit issues and so on. Um, but when we did fly it, um, it was fun, and it, we collected a lot of data. And another thing is that, um, you know, everybody talks about drones are like the best solution to collecting data. Um, yeah, for one day, my memory card was full, so I couldn't collect any more data. Or, you know, one of the cameras wasn't correctly plugged in, and so you don't collect anything. And so a million things can go wrong. Um, but it was nice to have. So what did we see in the end? Well, unfortunately, we saw a lot of deforestation. Um, this image on the right here, you probably can't see it, but um, people have chainsaws now, and they're actually making logs. They're making, like, flat um, logs from, these, from the mangrove trees they cut down. And um, some of it gets, when we, when we find it, we tell the authorities and they confiscate some of the stuff. And this is an area that was, um, you can see that. So there's an area which is a ton of logs and this pile got bigger and bigger and bigger every day. And we found out that people who would uh, collect these, um, they would get paid $1.50 per pole. And so that's why they just cut down tons of them because if they cut down 100 of them, then they'll get $100. So it's, um, it's, and there's only like three guys to patrol this whole place. So it's kind of impossible. Um, and on the right, this is what the lianas look like. So an area that is maybe degraded or cut down, I don't know where these lianas come from. They must come from upstream. Uh, these, they kind of basically invade and they can just cover and cover a whole you know, mangrove stand. So these are the kind of issues that, um, yeah, that we saw and we documented and we put into that map and so on and we're gonna use that data now to analyze all those things I told you about, the species, the degradation and the lianas. So it all goes together into the, into the data portal. Um, as I showed you before, and so um, <clears throat> that'll be used to, oh, it's still loading, and that'll be used to, yeah, to calibrate and validate all of the satellite image analysis that um, we'll do now in Google Earth Engine. So I don't know why that one's not loading this up before. So, and this is just um, something my colleague wrote in here that I thought was really nice. The Refugee Delta is, is an inspiring place. Let us protect it for future generations. And then here is... Um, so that's that tall guy, Carl, who was in the mud before. Um, that was him kind of wandering off. We called him the man in the mangrove. He's 64 years old. I think he's retiring next year, and this was maybe his last mangrove trip. So, um, yeah, and that's the uh, image I got uh, from one of these drones I purchased on Amazon for 800, for 600 euros. I'm happy to recommend it to you. Um, so, yeah, and you can take really um, amazing, amazing photos. So... If you're interested in this presentation, I think they'll send around a link later or grab the QR code and you can um, see it for yourself. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Aurelie. Um, should we do a Q&A session in English or in German? Either one, it's fine. Okay. Okay, also ihr könnt auch noch ein paar Fragen stellen. Wir haben noch fünf Minuten Zeit. Um, Gibt es noch Rückfragen zu dem Vortrag? Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I had a question about um, your drone. You said you have, you had two cameras, one normal and one IR, infrared camera. How does it work? Because you said you can measure with that how alive is are the species or the trees there. Like, how does it work? Yeah, sure. So the, so the near IR camera is actually um, replicating what the satellite sees. So a satellite actually collects... Um, what's called spectral bands, so it'll see red, green, and blue, which is what our eyes see, and then it collects all these other wavelengths, like near-infrared or short-wave-infrared. And near-infrared is just, um, you can go back to your science textbook, but it's just how um, leaves reflect near IR, and so, um, so when we measure that with the camera, the more that a leaf reflects, the, the healthier it is, and so that's, that's, how, it, that's how it works, yeah. 
but does it also, it, it only measures the plants, it doesn't measure any species also that are around there or... So the species, exactly, so the species we would recognize with our eyes or with looking at it, right? A, mm -hmm. certain, some species are tall and pointy, some of them have big leaves, some of them have small leaves, and that's what you actually see like in the image itself. So we can go and, and, and say, okay, that's Avicennia, that's Cereops, okay. and we can rec recognize Thank them. You. And with the field data then helps a little bit as well. So that's how we see it, yep. Any other questions? Yeah. Hi, so thanks for your presentation. I'm curious, have you thought about maybe using um, airborne laser scanners or something like this? Sure, so we did actually in another project in, um, it's in the Zambezi Delta, we actually, I wrote a paper on it in Mozambique, we did fly um, airborne LIDAR. It's super expensive. So if you have the money, sure. Um, but it's, it's just, uh, yeah, we, we didn't have the money in this project to do it, but, um, but LIDAR is pretty much the best data you can get because it sends a laser down into the canopy, bounces around, and comes back, and it gives you a lot of information on structure. Um, and that's actually how a lot of people uh, monitor biomass and, and measure the biomass in the trees um, to, yeah, to basically do carbon accounting for climate uh, projects and so on. So LIDAR is kind of the state of the art. Um, the, dro uh, the drone is kind of a poor person's LIDAR, I guess. We okay. do the best we can with it, yeah. Thank you. And my second question would be, so it looks like uh, what you presented is how you gained the data, but how much have you already worked with it? How much, pro how you processed with it? So, yeah, so the thing is, um, you might have seen, I collected this, this was just October, like fifth to twelfth, I only got back what uh, not even a month ago. So um, yeah, so the data is being processed um, and worked on. Um, you have to and and the drone actually data is actually very very uh, it's processing intensive because um, every time it takes a photo, the drone records a GPS location and just like a plane, the pitch, the yaw, the roll, and all these little infos. And so you have to go back and take that photo and take the information from the drone and put it together with the timing and so on. And of course, my camera has never has the same time as the drone um, because, you know, how do you set the time on a GoPro? It's, it's a real pain. So, um, so you have to kind of fit the timing. Then you put a GPS location on each of those images. And then you put it into a specialized program. All those images that overlap, there's actually programs that um, look at, they can analyze an image and they, it can recognize similar features and it overlaps the images and, and it does that. And that takes hours hours or days to process, um, just, you know, one survey. So, so that's where I am now. I'm kind, of in, I'm kind of in that stuff. And we're writing up all our reports and, you know, doing presentations like this, so it'll probably take a, at least a couple months till all the drone data is analyzed. Um, and then we'll put it back into the Google Earth Engine and all that running and stuff. So um, it'll be some time. It's not going to be immediate. Any other questions? Okay. But I, is, sorry, I think my question is pretty similar. Like, I think for collecting all this data for uh, running from satellites to servers to like producing tablets and everything, you need to run this global mega machine, which is causing the exploitation of nature and the destruction of ecosystems and everything. So I think I'm interested in the very big picture. Is it worth it? Like, what can you do with this data in the very end? Is it really worth to? exploit so much nature for protecting it? Or can you protect it like this? Or should we just leave it alone? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, you're right, we work with satellites. Think of all the fuel that goes into launching a satellite, and you know that rocket just explodes, and all of that stuff just <laughs> never comes back. Um, but I think there is value in it. I mean, did you see the last UN report? Um, I think it just came out now for the meeting in Egypt. Um, we're freaking out. This is the time where everybody should freak out about climate because we were warning about a two degree um, increase in climate, but we're headed towards four degrees. And that's, that's so much worse. And the things that we're seeing in California and all of these issues we're seeing, it's just only gonna get worse. And so I think we need to do everything we can now to understand the ecosystems, protect them, and do the best we can. Um, and, you know, in case of mangroves, mangroves have one of the biggest, we call it the biggest bang for your buck in ter um, for forests because of the habitat they provide, the value they provide, the climate um, value they provide. All those ecosystem services are extremely valuable. And so knowing, um, you know, how they get degraded and so on and how we can restore them, um, I think is really important. 
And you're right, everything has its offsides. You know, I have to fly down to, to Tanzania, and that's you know, also very you know, climate emitting. But, um, but if there's something we can do to reverse the trends, um, you know, now I think it's really important. We have a, um, a concept at WF called bending the curve. Um, I could show you every curve about biodiversity, climate, ecosystems, everything's going down. And nothing that we've done has done anything to stop it. The CBDs, all these IG targets, all of these sustainable development goals, nothing has changed that curve. But if there's little things that we can do to bend that curve, um, you know, whether it's map one area and understand what's happening in it, I think that's enough to do all those little things together to help you know, slow that trend or change that trend over time. And that's, that's the best we can do. Okay, just one more question and then we should move forward. <laughs> Need more microphones. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you for your project. I just have uh, the question. Um, it seemed to me that you were only looking at the ecosystem and perhaps not enough um, to the needs of the people there. Mm. How did you consider them and their problems? So that's, um, that's a, great, a great question. So there are, there's 12,000 people living in the refugee delta and yeah, there's, they're poor, they, they, have, you know, they fish as much as they can and, and they're basically doing what they can for survival. So um, actually the whole background of this work, uh, which I've neglected to mention, was to make a management plan and to actually come up with a way that you know, we could make this more sustainable. So the uh, cutting mangroves is completely illegal in Tanzania. How is that gonna help anybody who's living there if they can't cut down any trees to build their houses? So um, the ideas we have um, with some partners is to come up with a plan where it's sustainable. Mangroves are super resilient. You can cut down a couple branches or even a couple of trees and they'll grow back super fast. So there should be a way that if we can monitor it and actually manage it, then people could sustainably harvest. And there's a lot of cool stuff you could do. Maybe you can even um, you know, make a special luxury market for mangrove wood or something and, and sell externally, or, or you know, there's lots of ways that you can um, provide economic benefits from the mangroves. Um, we had ideas, there's tourism opportunities, things like that where you know, people can do things. Um, we saw all these women making baskets and rugs. Um, these are the kind of things that can pre be promoted and help the people, um, you know, help them with their livelihoods. So we're not only interested in the ecosystem, but the, the people play a really important part of it. And so we do need to, you know, to adapt to their, or to meet their needs and help them meet their needs. And I think, um, you know, this better management and these, these programs are, are what can help them. Okay. Great, so thanks. thank you very much, Orly, for insights to your project. <laughs>